Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Tonight's event highlights National Photography Month. Officially recognized in 1987, National Photography Month is an amazing opportunity to celebrate, celebrate both the history of photography and how it shaped the modern world. This evening's event highlights the recently released book to make their own way in the world, the enduring legacy of the Zeely daguerreotype. We are thrilled to welcome all of you as we partner with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, which was founded by Carter G. Woodson in 1915. Having launched our partnership during Black History Month this year, we are thrilled to continue our collaboration to ensure that important voices are heard. I'm honored to have Asala's national president, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, and contributing author to this evening's book with us. Evelyn is the Victor S. Thomas Professor of History and of African and African American Studies at Harvard University, where she has been on faculty since 1993 and has chaired both the Department of African and African American Studies and the Department of History. A pioneering scholar in African American women's history, she wrote the prize winning book Righteous Discontent, the Women's Movement in the Black Baptist Church from 1880 to 1920. She is the co, she also co-edited with Henry Louis Gates, the 21 volume African American National Biography. Dr. Higginbotham has received numerous awards and honors, most, most notably in September 2015 at the White House, President Obama awarded her the National Humanities Medal for illuminating the African-American journey in the United States history. Once again, we'd like to welcome Evelyn. Thank you. My name is Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. I am the national president of the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, ASALA, as we call ourselves. In welcoming you this evening, I can't help but tell you how excited we in ASALA are about our partnership with PBS Books. The book talks make possible the opportunity to share moments for learning by means of wonderful conversations about fascinating publications on the Black experience. And it was Heather Marie here at PBS who mentioned to me that May is National Photography Month. I didn't know that, did you? But I investigated it and sure enough, she's right. Congress established this uh, month in 1987 for the important role of photography in society. So on this May evening, I'm thrilled to announce and to even participate in the discussion of the anthology to make their own way in the world, the enduring legacy of the Zeely daguerreotypes, which is co-edited by Elisa Barbash, Molly Rogers, and Deborah Willis. This book vividly reveals that for African Americans, photography has been used for good purposes and for bad, really troubling purposes. No one knew this better than Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who founded Asala 106 years ago, and he did so with a keen awareness of the negative effects of racist visual images that appeared in books, on soap wrappers, pancake boxes, in films, everywhere. And thus, for Woodson, it was important to include alternative visual images in historical writings on Black people, Visual images were to him part and parcel of telling our story, conveying a counter narrative that affirmed our dignity. And I learned about this, this connection between photographs and written history at a young age. After Woodson's death in 1950, my father became the editor of Asala's Negro History Bulletin, now called the Black History Bulletin. And he would take me with him to the Asala office on many a Saturday when the bulletin was being put together. And during those early years, 
I spent far more time looking at the visual images on the covers and inside the pages of the Negro History Bulletin. I did that more than reading the content articles. But that time spent in reading would come later. But at a young age, it was easy, easy to perceive the photographs as making history come to life and making the past somehow more real. The photographs and drawings of abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, of black Union soldiers in uniform, of black congressmen during Reconstruction, and so much more. Black history was missing in my school textbooks, but I knew the truth because the black presence and contribution to America and the world were authenticated through a photographer's lens. I looked at those photographs the way I look at footnotes today. They provided the necessary evidence. As you will hear and certainly see, photographs reveal the great difficulties, the pain and the hard road of injustice. But they also reveal the victories of those who went before us. They reveal the love of family, and the shoulders upon which we stand. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Evelyn. And thank you so much for sharing your personal stories and your insights with us. Your collaboration and that of Asala's means so very much to PBS Books. Well, this evening, we'd also like to thank our library network across the country, as well as local PBS stations, and Asala TV for sharing the conversation with all of you. And thank you for joining us. Today's conversation has four featured guests. You've already met Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, Asala's president and contributing author. Uh, I'd also like to introduce another member of, of tonight's uh, panel, and that would be Dr. Deborah Willis. She is the university professor and chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University and has been affiliated appointment with the College of Arts and Sciences Department of Social and Cultural Analysis Africana Studies where she teaches courses on photography and imaging and cultural histories visualizing the black body, women and gender. Her research emphasizes photography's multifaceted histories, visual culture, and photographic history of slavery and emancipation, contemporary women, photographers, and beauty. She has received the MacArthur Fellowship, a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship as well. Dr. Willis is the author of Posing Beauty, African-American Images from 1890s to the Present and co-author of The Black Female Body, A Photographic History, Envisioning Emancipation and Michelle Obama, The First Lady in Photographs. Professor Willis has curated numerous exhibitions and co-organized thematic conferences exploring imaging and the black body. She has appeared and consulted on media projects, including documentary films, uh, including American Photography, which is a PBS documentary. She is also an editor and contributor of today's book. Thank you, Dr. Willis, for being here this evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to share um, this moment and National Photography Month. And that's pretty amazing to consider the way that we have found this day to share the research that we worked on for the past four years in unpacking and thinking and rethinking about how to tell this difficult and necessary story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, this evening we also have Dr. Sarah Elizabeth Lewis. She is an associate professor at Harvard University in the Department of History of Art and Architecture and the Department of African and African American Studies. She is the founder of the Vision and Justice Project. Lewis has published essays on race, contemporary art and culture with forthcoming publications, including a book on race, whiteness and photography. 
vision, and justice, an anthology on the work of Carrie Mae Reams, and an article focusing on the groundwork of contemporary arts in the context of Stand Your Ground Laws. In 2019, she became the inaugural recipient of the Freedom Scholar Award presented by Asala. And Dr. Lewis is a contributing author to today's book. Welcome, Dr. Lewis. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here with everyone. Well, thank you. To guide the conversation today, we have Lisa Barbash. Lisa Barbash is a curator of visual anthropology at Harvard University's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Anthology. She has also co-directed award-winning doc award documentary films. She co-wrote cross-cultural filmmaking and co-edited The Cinema of Robert Gardner. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Heather. Um, it's it's really wonderful to be here and to be here with my wonderful, distinguished colleagues on this book. Well, you are both an editor and a contributing author of of this important book, and um, this book it contains. I know it contains early photographs daguerreotypes. It has some of the most challenging images in the history of photography. I believe 15 daguerreotypes of men and women of African descent who were enslaved in South Carolina. I know that this book is extraordinarily sensitive and complicated to unpack, that this, this work took eight years um, of work um, and represents the work of 23 artists and writers, scholars. Um, what inspired you to work on this book and to collaborate with others and how did you go about it? Well, it, these images are um, housed at the Peabody Museum where I have been working for about 15 years. And I think that every single person who has encountered them sees them, is shocked by them, and is compelled to do something about them. And doing something about them could mean producing a wonderful transformative artwork, such as Carrie Mae Weems's work, which we'll see a little bit later in the talk, or writing articles or digging much deeper into the history of the individuals um, who are pictured in the daguerreotypes. So uh, it, it took a number of years, a number of um, very talented colleagues, a couple of Radcliffe workshops, and uh, a collaboration with, between Aperture Books and uh, Peabody Museum uh, Press to, to produce this book. And I also wanna give a shout out to a number of students who had viewed the images in a class run by uh, Professor Robin Bernstein, and they very generously shared their observations in uh, short essays in the book. Thank you. Can you share a little bit about the history of the daguerreotypes, the Zeely daguerreotypes, and how they came, how they can be, um, I guess, how they came into the public's eye? Sure, I would love to. Um, I think in order to allow people to better visualize the book, which is all about the interweaving of images and history, um, it'll be good to start sharing some images with you. Um, this is the cover of the book. Um, the centerpiece of the book is a set, as you say, of 15 daguerreotypes. Uh, they, these are photographs uh, using the earliest technology of photography, um, which is a medium that came into being in 1839. These pictures were taken in 1850 of seven enslaved people. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is Fasina, one of the people um, in the slides. He, Alfred, Delia, Drena, Jack, Jem, and Renty were all photographed and enslaved against their will. Next slide, please. Their photographs were taken in 1850 in Columbia, South Carolina, by
by studio photographer Joseph Zeely for Harvard scientist Louis Agassiz, who you can see to the left. Agassiz had intended to use these images to support his theory of polygenesis. And this was the belief that humans, rather than all of them descending from one origin, that peoples of different races, races were of different origins. And you can imagine um, how horrific it would be to even hear this theory today. It was a theory that was of scientific racism that was discounted even in its time and then shortly disproved by Charles Darwin. Next slide, please. Agassiz presented these daguerreotypes publicly only once, and we can see that, that his project, his mission, was a failure from the start. Um, he put them away. They were lost to history until their rediscovery in an attic cabinet at Harvard's Peabody Museum in 1976. And then some research was done on them and they made headlines in newspapers in 1977. Since their rediscovery, the photographs have prompted intense discussion, study, and controversy. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, a picture of Jack, and I will talk about Jack in, 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 in a moment. Next slide, please. This is also Jack. You can see that these pictures of Jack have him in a, um, can you go back to the, the one before? Um, you can see that, that he is um, posed looking uh, straight at us, and his clothes have been pulled down. There's a little label attached to the case of the daguerreotype, and this, this case snaps closed. And the labels, which I'll talk about in a minute, give clues to his identity. Um, we have him in a view from the front, and then with the next slide, we're gonna see him with a view to, a, to the side. These were called anthropometric poses. These people, um, seven different individuals, were posed in this way in order to be cataloged in order to look at their physical features and compare them to other people's photographs. Next photograph, uh, next slide, please. So this is the question that all of us have asked uh, when we see these, and Henry Louis Gates titled his foreword to the book, Who Are These People? Um, next slide, please. Um, building on earlier, research by Eleanor Reichlin and Molly Rogers, uh, one of the editors of the book who wrote a wonderful book called Delia's Tears. Um, we had a great uh, biographical detective, I call him, author Greg Hekimovich, who conducted a deep dive into archives in Columbia, South Carolina, and libraries. And I wanna give a shout out to libraries here because um, without the help of libraries and their staff, none of this research could have been done. Um, and Greg found new information about these individuals. Um, this is Fasina. He was a carpenter. He was born in Africa. He was enslaved on the plantation of Colonel Wade Hampton II. Fasina might have worked to construct Millwood, the Hampton mansion, and there's evidence in the 1870 Richland County census that after emancipation, Fasina lived alone in Richland County. Next slide, please. This is Millwood Plantation. That, that, uh, these are the only ruins that still exist of the plantations on which these seven individuals uh, were enslaved. Um, they were enslaved by four different plantations or, or businesses. Next slide, please. Okay, this is, these are the labels in, in close-up. Fasina's um, label is to the right. You can see Carpenter Mandingo, born in Africa, plantation of Colonel Wade Hampton um, near Columbia, South Carolina. To the left, we have a label for Jack, who was a driver or kind of overseer from Guinea. He and his daughter, Drena, likely worked on the cotton fields of Benjamin Franklin Taylor's Grubfield Plantation. Renty and his daughter Delia also worked on the Taylor Plantation. And then two other individuals, Alfred and Jim, likely worked on building projects in Columbia. Next slide, please. We see Jack again. Um, 
The book that we are about to talk about, or have started talking about actually, explores the lives of these individuals, as well as the impact these photographs have had and continue to have. Next slide, please. In the ongoing discussion of race and racial justice in the United States. So that's my mini encapsulation of, of what the book is all about. As Heather said, there are 23 different artists and authors who've contributed to this book. And I think um, as, as you listen to my colleagues who are going to be speaking shortly, you'll see that um, we decided that the best way to approach this book was through a multidisciplinary, multi-point of view approach, that we really couldn't do these complicated images justice without um, going to, um, without multiple points of view and dialogues about the images. So I would like to start with a question for my wonderful co-editor, Deborah Willis. And I know that Deborah, um, the rediscovery of these images in 1976 made an impact on you when you were a photographer and photo historian starting out. And I wonder if you can talk about that impact on you and, and on the world and on photographic history. Thank you, Barbara. It was an important time in terms of that 1976, of course, in terms of the year for um, the US, but also I was a student at the time and having the opportunity to read papers and write about black photographers and make images about black life I happened to read um, in the New York Times that this the discovery in the attic at Harvard of, of the daguerreotypes. I read about it. I was struck by the, the narrative of, of the discovery, but also the types of images that were presented in representing black people um, during slavery. So I was I wanted to know more about the people. I was curious about the posing, the anthropological studies, but also the dress, the way that Dahlia and Drena's dresses were pulled down. And I, I wanted to know more. And I spent the next 15 or so 20 years following the history of the making of the images, the locations in in South Carolina and and continued with a dialogue about them. Thank you. Um, we will talk more about that, but but to to move along, um, you know, I know Deb that you have taught with these images, and um, Sarah Lewis uh, has taught with these images many times at Harvard. And I wanted to um, now turn a question over to Sarah about how you teach with these images and um, how you prepare yourself to actually teach with these difficult images and how you prepare your students to, to actually be able to look at them. Hmm. Um, thank you for the important question. And the framework that I use for teaching, I think is important just to top line here. You know, how have the arts, how has visual representation allowed for and constructed and critiqued our representational democracy? Uh, this is the primary question of, of the courses that I, I teach. And so it's also important to remember that students, I think, are living in a moment in which we understand the importance of discernment. We are in a crisis of regard. Um, we have near daily reminders of the fragility of American rights, uh, which have not only been secured by norms and laws, but by vision and by the image, ultimately. Uh, this kind of lack of regard falls into a blind spot of the Constitution. It's one that the 14th Amendment was meant to secure, but we know it's really the work of culture that often does this. In teaching the students, I think the the structure of, of the course introduces them to the work of Frederick Douglass even before they encounter the Zeely daguerreotypes, which offers them a way of understanding uh, the power of these images. In 1861, Frederick Douglass gave a speech near Boston's Tremont Temple and surprised 
his audience by arguing for what could have seemed like a trifle in the state of that nation severing conflict, um, namely pictures and the power they would have to create a critical imagination that Douglas argued was crucial for American progress. He redrafted the speech multiple times over the course of his life. He continued to believe that, at the, as he said at the end of his speech, it might take over 150 years for someone to come along and better explain what he meant. And I know we have in the really table of contents of this book and those editing the book, the individuals who he had in mind, uh, Deborah Willis and Carrie Mae Weems and Evelyn Higginbotham. He was making this case, though, about the power of pictures for a number of reasons. I mean, first, it was the invention of the new medium in 1839 with the daguerreotype. Secondly, he saw photographs as a social leveling force. But thirdly, he understood the way in which racial science had weaponized and instrumentalized photographs to perform a kind of violence. Um, he gave a speech years prior in 1854 um, in which he decried the use of aesthetics by the American School of Ethnology uh, to, to read the Negro, quote, out of the human family. And so with pictures in progress, he was in that speech, he was thinking about ways in which the image could read, uh, at the time he would say Negroes, back in. You can best understand then, I would say, the power of these images, and students, I think, believe this is true, um, by understanding Douglas and then encountering the Zealie daguerreotypes. So if we could advance to the next slide. Here we're seeing the intervention that the contemporary artist Carrie Mae Weems has made to crop out uh, some of the features of the images that allow us to see what Douglas was responding to, the use of a new template, a compositional template that moved images from ones of honor, creating portraits, to ones of denigration that could create types. Here we have the matte uh, board cropping out, as Deborah Willis mentioned, the kind of bunching of the clothing around their laps, an indication of lack of agency, for example. Uh, and in the next slide, we see much the same. And overlaid on these images are text that give us a sense of what these photographs became, right? An anthropological debate. Uh, every time I teach, and I just sort of end by saying this, I walk into a building that reminds me of the foundation that these images created for the history of visuality. I teach at the Harvard Art Museums, and there's a plaque on the left that indicates that it is built on the site of Louis Agassiz's home. These images by Joseph T. Zealy were taken at his behest in an attempt to prove polygenesis. And there, as you walk into the museum, often on the left are those exact images that we've just seen by Carrie Mae Weems, really speaking back to the history and the foundations of racial science and the history of visuality. My students are animated by seeing themselves in lineage with this history, sitting as they are in a lecture hall um, on the very foundations of Agassiz's home. So it's always a powerful set of units and it's um, both difficult and rewarding um, to be able to teach them about this moment in history. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we have your, you've presented Carrie's work as, as a beautiful counter narrative or transformation of the narrative. Um, one of the most wonderful contributions in, in the book is Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's own narrative of her family. And Evelyn's contribution involves mining her own family history for photographs. Um, after being introduced to photographs um, in your childhood. And I wonder if you can talk about how photography can help to recover the history of slavery, its legacy, and the lives of the enslaved in light of your own family history. Thank you, Elisa. You know, when I, when I talk about these photographs and I talk about my great-grandparents and and grandparents. I'm talking about people who were literally enslaved. My father was born in 1897. 
and he was 24 years older than my mother. So I wasn't able to visit my grandparents the way I could visit my, my father's parents, the way I could visit my mother's. And yet it's through, it's through photographs that I got to know them. And, and I got to know them uh, as children, which is really unusual as a child seeing my grandmother, Eva Holmes Brooks, and Eva is a little girl. In this picture, Eva is the, the little girl. She is my father's mother. And the older woman is her mother, who is my great grandmother on my father's, on my mother, my grand, my father's mother's side. I also got to see my grandfather, Walter Henderson Brooks. And if you could show that, Walter was about 15 years old when this was taken. This was taken in 1866. He would have been looking just like this a year earlier when he was in slavery. And so their story is a story that tells not just simply about children during slavery, but it also tells you about the difference in the types of slavery that existed. Because my history goes back to Richmond, Virginia, the most industrial of the slave cities. And so because it was so industrial, my grandfather was literally owned by a tobacco factory. He was owned by an institution. He was initially owned by the same person who owned his mother and his siblings. But when that man died in 1857, my grandfather at six years old reached the stark conclusion that he was property. My grandfather and his brothers and his sister and his mother were property. And so his mother walked the streets of Richmond to find a, a buyer, a buyer for Walter and for his brother. And she did that for all of her children. Um, and the tobacco factory bought them. Now, one of the children, the oldest child, was a young woman, 19 years old, only 19. And this was Margaret Ann. She was, I'm sorry, the oldest of the, the children. She was the oldest sibling of of um, Walter, my grandfather. Um, and she was, this picture, this photograph is from 1858. She, she learned to read. That made her a problem for sale. And so even though my, grand, my great grandmother had worked out the sale of her children, she worked out a plan for Margaret Ann, hoping to keep her protected in Richmond but when it was learned that she could read, then the people who recently bought her sold her off. Now, Richmond is an interesting story, and I talk about it in depth in the article because you can see there's a lot more mobility. There's a lot more mobility from my grandfather's father, Albert. Um, there's a lot more mobility for slaves because when you work in a factory, you're not, there is no big house. And so they, they gave them money, but they also had to pay back that money, and they also had to use it for themselves. But the interesting thing about Margaret Ann, and you look at that photograph of her, and you think, wow, well, that she must have been a special kind of slave. But not only was this much more common to dress like this in Richmond, because it was an industrial city, even though slaves, but that photograph betrays what really happened to her because she was sold off because she could read into slavery in Tennessee. She was never seen again. And my grandfather wrote this. He said, it was not until after the Civil War, my mother and father learned of her death. If we only knew where her lifeless form is buried, we'd mark the spot and tell our children's ch children of her taken away. And so my father and a lot of the Brooks family they tell the story of Margaret Ann, and it was much later. I was in my 30s when I finally saw this photograph of Margaret Ann. And I say in the book how I was overcome by a powerful emotion because I'd heard so many years about the sister of my grandfather being sold away. And finally seeing her, I felt she'd come back home. I'm finished. I, I, one of the authors in our uh,
collective, um, Matthew Fox Amato has written about enslaved people's own uses of photography. And there was a wonderful moment in the seminar where Matthew confessed that even though he'd written this wonderful essay and, and now a book, he had not been able to find any photographs of enslaved people that were taken, that were commissioned by the enslaved people themselves. And your picture of, of Margaret Ann is one of the most extraordinary photographs I think I've ever seen. And um, it was commissioned, Lisa, because they knew they weren't ever gonna see her again. So her father and mother, Albert, her father, got that done. And there actually were people of African descent who were um, photographers and daguerreotypes in, in Richmond. Um, Deborah has written about such people. So, so this is a time, I think you said in the very beginning, where, where photographs you know, can be used for good and for evil. They can be used to empower, to disempower. Um, I want to get back to the dis, to the um, Zeely daguerreotypes um, and and ask maybe you first, Evelyn, and then we'll go to um, Deb and Sarah about how do you get yourself to teach with these images? How do you get yourself to talk about them because they are so tragic? They are tragic, and so I talk about the good and the bad. And by the good and the bad, this is what I mean, because you know, the title of the book is to make their own way in the world. And so how do people make their own way in the world when they are perceived as property bought and sold, disfigured, disrespected um, like this? So one of the things that was important for me to argue is that photographs are not only, they're not only sources of history, they are literally harbingers of histories waiting to be written. The story of, 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 of Delia would not be written until much her story. Her face was there, but her story would not be written till much later. Well, I found that I had to do that with my family because I had a great grandfather and this is Walter's father and the man my father was named after, Albert Royal Brooks. And Albert Royal Brooks uh, was a slave. Um, he had a different owner from his wife, Lucy. And that's why when Lucy and the children were sold, he didn't have the same problem. He had a different owner. But Albert was a man, a very industrious man, even as a slave, because he hired himself out, his owner, I should say, hired him out. And so after the war, Albert, and this is how I first discover Albert, my father is teaching me about the man who's named after him, or he's named after, I should say. And so my father said, well, that is your great grandfather, that man sitting there, third from the left. And you can see this is a man of African features. He looks not much different from the slaves of Renty and Fasana and others. The big difference is that he's got on clothes. But this is the trial for Jefferson Davis. This is the jury, rather, the jury pool for Jefferson Davis. So Albert Royal Brooks, who was born in 1817 and died in 1881, sat on the uh, jury pool to try Jefferson Davis. And that image has lots of meaning because the image is made up of black men and white men. And it was a, a, a way to look at the New South, this, this picture in 1867, the trial never took place, but that image very much bothered the legal team of Jefferson Davis. The other thing is looking at the Lucy. How did Lucy make her way in the world after the war? Remember she was a slave, but Albert actually worked out the payment for her freedom. But after the war, she started, she took the lead in organizing black and white women in the establishment of the state's first orphanage for black children. And obviously she was thinking about Margaret Ann when she started that, that orphanage in 1871. There is a marker today that's erected that speaks of her identifying her as part of that. And more than that, her image 
is on the building that now still serves children, children of low income, children, um, black children today. And then finally, my grandfather, their son, Albert and Lucy's son, Walter Henderson Brooks, who was born a slave. He becomes educated. He goes to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. And then he moves to Washington, D.C. to pastor the 19th Street Baptist Church. He went there in 1882. By 1909, he's doing amazing things with that church. One of the reasons I wanted people to see this image of the, of the church calendar is because you see that he is the face of the church, that he has a central image. But even more interesting than that, historians will only later write about what we see in this photograph, because what we see is a calendar for raising money to meet the social needs of black people. And at the very bottom, it talks about the church dispensary. In 1909, this social gospel black church actually has a health clinic. And in that health clinic, because it's written about in an article that says strong pastor of a strong church, it describes the clinic as having a free dispensary under the care of a dozen physicians, a pharmacist, tra trained nurses, and dentists. So when we think of churches even today that are now sponsoring vaccines, we can look back and as early as 1909, we know they do that because of this photograph. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn. I think what I, I have a couple of housekeeping things. One is that I'm supposed to weigh in with a reminder that um, if you've just joined us, we are watching. You are watching PBS Books, and this is a program about the book to make their own way in the world: the enduring legacy of the Zeely Daguerreotypes. What I'd like now is to ask Deb and Sarah together. Um, starting with Deb, to talk about Carrie Mae Weems. And we have some slides um, of Carrie Mae Weems's work. And I know the two of you talk about Carrie Mae Weems all the time, <laughs> with, about, um, and, and if the two of you can, can perhaps, um, starting with Deb, have something of a conversation and, and tell us about why, why we are even talking about Carrie Mae Weems in the context of, of, of this historic book this book about history? Well, I really love uh, listening to Evelyn's family story. It's central to what we're doing today. Um, to The fact that Carrie is able to reimagine a woman's story through dress, through performance, but also through identity. And, and why these images to me are, are important is the, the notion of humanity, that we have seen um, images of, of Black people that rarely had an opportunity to see the, the depth of, of their humanity. And even though the images were made to dispel and to create um, a, a negative or uh, see Black people as, as subhuman, they, it, didn't, it didn't happen. We see their humanity in the posing, we see their references to their bodies, and if we can go to the images of Carrie. So here we, we see place, and, and the central part of Carrie's story is, you know, sitting upon the ruins, we see this representation of a woman who is not only inside the house, caring for the house, but also reflecting on families who left to go to Tennessee who were sold off in other areas. So Carrie is giving us an opportunity for us to reflect, but also pronounce the humanity of, of the women, but also the beauty. And, and, and we know that the women are, and we go to the next slide, are making clothes. Um, they're making the curtains, they're, they're cooking in the kitchen. So they are creating a space for white families to survive but also they're creating a space for them. As Carrie looked at images and she says, I looked and looked to see what so terrified you. She's asking this historical, rhetorical reference of, of the negative images that black people 
have, have we've seen of black people, but she's also recognizing her beauty. And, and I, I love this image. I love the antebellum type quilt. And so she's honoring the work of women, of black women specifically, but also the style that's created that's, that shows the beauty of, of the body. We can go to the next slide. When we see this image here by Henry Moore, who, who felt it important to document during the Civil War, not only the, the soldiers and the sailors, but he was interested in the land. And they were also, he was from New Hampshire. He was interested in who's coming north after the war. They wanted to see, and these images were, were souvenir images, but they were also images as documentation. So looking at this image of sweet potato planting, we can also see another story developed in this, 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 this tableau. And, and I love this image because it's telling the story of, of labor, yes, but also the history. If we look at the weed, the, the woven baskets, we know that the grass baskets are part of a West African tradition. So we see that aspect of the story being developed. We also see head wrap. We see that women took care of their hair, um, not only because of the heat and the sand and the dirt, but they're also stylized in a way from recognizing from family members from different parts of West Africa. So that's part of it. But also the apron that the, the, the woman in the front is, is, is posed. So we know it's a posed image. We know that the men, they're wearing um, Civil War caps and, and, and coats, that this plantation was left and the black people lived there. They stayed, they cultivated the land and created um, their own lifestyle and taking care of the land. So we see children, men and women, and, and the sense of mobility and, and caring for this. And, and Henry Moore was there early on, 1862, to create this image. And sweet potato, and when we think about the sweet potato, we also, people call it yam. And so we see the different types of foods that were part of Southern culture, but also part of West African. If we can go to the next slide. So here Carrie uses this image and she explores the aspect of what it means to, to pose, but also the blood that she uses the red as a reference for, for the life blood of these people. So it's scratched, it's torn, it's complicated. And she's allowing us to imagine this complicated story that is also a beautiful story about humanity. Next slide. She also moves not only from South Carolina, but also to Louisiana. And she has a project um, called the Louis, the project called is titled Louisiana Project, where um, she's also wearing um, a, just kind of a white dress that she allows it to flow through a memory. And we can go to the next slide, to the experience in South Carolina. So she's using this as a journey, a time journey, as a time traveler in the past, but also a time traveler through photography. We know that there were houses that were built for Black people to, to pray, um, to sing. Um, there were spaces for ceremonial spaces for burial ground. And Carrie is documenting these moments of peace and solace but also memory and the praise house when one walks in that is a, a sense of, for a space for um for reflection and here we see the two together and the next slide um i think that's it De mm -hmm. deb yeah. for carrie's mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. um that was amazing unpacking of carrie's work we have questions from the audience and sarah um as an historian uh, art historian perhaps you can answer this question, and um, it's a it's it's from Anthony on Facebook. He says, "I've been reading a book, Race After Technology, and there are um, he he says there ha the the book discusses problems with how darker skin tones may have come out in early color photographs, 
and is interested in knowing how the evolution of photography has impacted the ability to document um, people of color. Is that something? Sure, sure. I can address. Sure, I've researched this, written about this, but if I may, I'd like to just um, continue on to the salute of Carrie Mae Weems first, and I can okay. address that question as well, because we're really here gathered also because of the courage it took for her to address these objects as photographs that should be understood as shaking the ground of history. Um, Carrie Mae Weems is someone who one of my students has described as an oracle. When she came to my class, that was the way in which the student felt so moved and affected. One of Carrie's uh, strengths that she has so many is that she is able to ask the questions that we need at a particular moment in time in history. Um, for example, you know, thinking about as, as Evelyn has mentioned, photographs as evidence, she's asked this fundamental question, how do you measure a life, right? In her most recent project, Grace Notes. I mentioned all this because when she came to the Zeely daguerreotypes, uh, when she visited the Peabody, you know, she wasn't granted permission to use those objects. As we know, the history is now well known. Uh, she effectively wrested them from the archive and, and used them in, in a photographic series that then resulted in this question about whether she should be sued or not for a violation of that contract. And that kind of moral courage, because as she saw it, she might not have a legal right to the objects, but she had a kind of moral right to interrogate their, their place in history, um, is, is the kind of leadership that the arts offer during moments of crisis or kind of sedimentation in history. So she's, she's an extraordinary artist who I think has forced us to reckon with uh, history in many ways. Uh, her audience is is both history and the future, and she kind of stands in this moment at the present, really forcing us to ask the questions that often are not addressed. That that is really beautiful, and and I I absolutely agree with you. Um, I know we um, I'm getting some um, I'm mindful of time. I wonder, Sarah, or or if you could. Um, address the question about changes in technology of photography? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I think what I'd say succinctly is that the questioner is, is correct, and I'm glad they're reading books such as Race After Technology. There's an extraordinary amount of research, um, much of it spearheaded by Lorna Roth, that's gone into an understanding of the norms that are embedded in film emulsion technology, which is then carried over into digital technology, which centralized whiteness as the ideal type on which all the chromatic decisions are made, right? Uh, a good example of this is to just look up after the talk, uh, the, the Shirley card, uh, which was used to kind of define an, an idealized skin tone. And Shirley was a, a woman who was white upon whom developing labs would, would calibrate the chemicals in Kodak and, and Fuji and, and all the other film technologies. It actually took, as we know from Roth's research, um, furniture companies and chocolate companies complaining to Kodak that they couldn't adequately show the variation in their, their goods, the wood and the chocolate, for Kodak in particular to respond and to change the uh, chemical makeup of film emulsion technology to better accommodate skin tones like mine, right? And I know that technology was um, Kodak Gold Max and was the only film that growing up my family would use to capture the range of our, our skin tones. And that history is still with us, you know, in our smartphones, in every time we take a photograph. So we are looking at the history of racial science. We are looking at, at the history of race effectively every time we just use the kind of quotidian daily things we use to capture our daily life. Now, I, I wonder if um, there's so much more to say here about the opportunities that this offers in terms of correction and the opportunities that photographs give us in general to document a more full history that has been captured. But to answer that particular question, you do need to go back to that, that almost unbelievable moment. <laughs> right. 
Wonderful, wonderful answer. Um, I have, um, a, there's a question about what photography equipment looked like back in the day of Zeely. Um, Deb, can you describe very, very briefly, because we have one minute, what Zeely Studio might have looked like? Yeah, large format camera that stood probably mid chest. And um, the camera was a, you know, a large box at, in terms of type. And, um, you know, on stanchions, which would tripods, and they sometimes the models or the poser or the the subjects were had the um, had guards to hold their body still. So there were different types of um, cameras during that time, but they were difficult to create and make. Not only technology for the te techno technology, but also for the people being photographed. So imagine they're also looking into their history. Um, and the future um, through these images. So it was cumbersome. And it, it was, it would, it would be kind of painful actually to sit still for the amount of time it would take for yes. a good exposure. Yes. And, and that is one of the interesting things also to think about with the Zeely daguerreotypes is people had to hold their position sometimes, you know, pressed up against a brace in order to make sure that their photographs wouldn't come out blurry because of the long exposure time. Well, we have a, one 30 seconds left. Why is it important that Evelyn's essay is significant for this book? Dress. When we see the dress body in, the, in that essay and the undress body throughout this book, we begin to have a different dialogue about how the enslaved body also wanted to present themselves. So I just want to thank you, Evelyn, for, for a wonderful contribution to our project. Well, well, thank I you, you, Deb. I just also want to say this, and it's a um, tribute to Deb, that when I, I found the, the photographs, or you know, well, I didn't find them, they were, they were in my family, but, but the photographs, often on the back or at the bottoms, they have the names of the photographers Yes. Many of these photographers are black photographers it's that so Deb fun. has actually written about. So she yeah. was really tickled to see <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. they were using all your all your photographers. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I felt they were family. <laughs> it, it, it comes around. Um, I am so happy to be reunited with with you three. Um, and, and it's been such a pleasure being able to to learn even more about um, your your how deeply you've dug into to history and and photography i think we've got to um start heading out now i'm not sure how heather is going to do this but thank you all very much heather um we'd love you to join us now thank you thank you so we are at the top of the hour and we need to close the conversation i'd like to thank lisa deb Evelyn and Sarah for your tremendous insights, your your amazing work um, on this on this topic, sharing with us the power of photography, both the good and the bad, the power of memory and how art can transform bad things and, and spark dialogue for today. Um, so thank you so very much for that. Um, we also wanted to thank Lisa for guiding the conversation and bringing us on this journey. We hope you will continue to join PBS Books for this these important conversations. So until next time, we look forward to our next conversation and helping to make your, your life a little more enhanced and enriched. Thank you so very much for joining us and from PBS Books. Have a good evening.